Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming in on this dreary, rainy day, but now you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, enlightenment and sunshine from our guest speaker, Professor John Jackson, when he talks about unmanned systems. But before he gets to that, let me just say it's a privilege to welcome you to this third installment, this third event in our Issues in National Security Lecture Series. My name is Tim Schultz. I am the Associate Dean of Academics here at the Naval War College. And I get to work every day with our speaker, Professor John Jackson. More on him in a minute. But be before then, let me just acknowledge a few people who are here, who are part of the team, uh, who are important to all of us in this room. I'll start out with the fact I noticed there's a Boy Scout among us. I love to see that. Welcome, young man. Uh, we also have other people who are interested in community service. Uh, Anne from Fleet and Family Services, uh, Fleet and Family Support Center is way in the back. She's waiting for you to come talk to her about their many programs and services. Thank you, Anne, for coming. We have Dean and Teresa right down here with our MWR organization. They are here to help you in numerous ways. And also, for the first time, we have Melissa Fumara from Military One Source. And that's a DOD-sponsored organization. They provide a lot of different services, including uh, free tax filing support. So talk to Melissa if you have to pay taxes. <laughs> also, thank you. I know there are a number of members of the Naval War College Foundation here. Thank you for coming. And we have uh, a number of flag officers here, including the president of the Naval War College, Admiral Chatfield. Thank you, ma'am, for coming. And uh, her husband, David, thank you, David, for making the trip as well. And a bunch of other admirals that I've spotted in the crowd. Thank you, sirs and ma'ams, for joining us. OK, now, briefly to John Jackson. He is our Elmer A. Sperry Chair of Unmanned and Robotic Systems here at the Naval War College, which is a fantastic title because he does fantastic work. Something he's done recently is he was the Naval War College representative to this fantastic conference that was all the way out in Rome. It was, get this title, it was the Leonardo da Vinci Foundation Conference on the Ethics and Law of Artificial Intelligence. And who shows up to that from America? John Jackson is, the represent, is representing the United States at the Leonardo da Vinci Foundation Conference on Ethics and the Law of Artificial Intelligence. How do we know he was there? Because I have seen with my own eyes a picture of John Jackson standing next to and shaking the hand of the Prime Minister of Italy. And in the Prime Minister of Italy's other hand, what is he holding? He is holding this. Behold, it is John Jackson's book, One Nation Under Drones. It found its way all the way to the prime minister's hands. Maybe they're uh, translated into Italian already. John teaches our unmanned systems and conflict course, our elective. Uh, he teaches it twice a year. It's one of those few electives we offer more than once due to its, its quality, its timeliness, and the tremendous demand among the students who want to take it. Uh, so we appreciate his expertise that he brings to the Naval War College, which he will momentarily bring to you. He goes by a number of nicknames. Here are three of my favorites. Professor John Jackson is the Caesar of Cyborgs, the Raj of Robots, and may I introduce to you the Duke of Drones, John Jackson. <laughs> Too sure. kind, too kind. All right, I have somebody else who's going to help me today. Stay there. <laughs> they can be very temperamental, so I've got to watch this guy. So, anyway, this is B my friend BB-8, who you're all familiar with. 
from the movies. I think maybe I'd better take his head off. <laughs> now, I don't know what impact that's going to have. <laughs> it could come looking for me, but anyway. Uh, this is a serious subject, uh, but we're going to have a little bit of fun with it this afternoon. And uh, as uh, uh, was indicated in the introduction, I hold the E.A. Sperry Chair of Unmanned Systems. Uh, E.A. Sperry, Elmer Sperry, was an inventor back in the early 1900s. <laughs> it's going to keep talking. Uh, he invented the gyro compass and a lot of other things and whatnot. So we've named the Unmanned Systems after, uh, after Mr. Sperry. So I wanted to emulate the guy, so I grew a mustache. Uh, my wife, who's in the back, said I look like a riverboat gambler or a used car salesman. So uh, we have shaved that mustache never to be seen again. So uh, The subject of uh, robotics and unmanned systems, you know, you can't pick up a magazine, newspaper, anything else without seeing something about the subject. It's always in the news. And so it's something we ought to spend a little bit of time, uh, a little bit of time understanding better. So the question is, is this a new idea? And as usual in these kind of situations, not really. This is back in 1918, and this is uh, uh, Sperry's automatic airplane. And this is a model of the airplane that we have down in our Future Forces Gallery, which is uh, down near the library where we have a lot of examples of robotics and other things. Uh, this was a machine uh, in the 1918 time frame. You could barely get an airplane in the air with a human being flying it, so could you do it with a robot? So the idea here is you'd fuel it up, you'd fill it full of explosives, you'd point it in the general direction of the target, it would take off, it would count the number of times the propeller went around, and when it got to a certain number, it would cut off the engine and it would dive on the target. Okay? Not exactly precision-guided munitions, but uh, that was the attempt of the day. And it was uh, moderately successful. Uh, the aerial torpedo and a few other designs were, were developed uh, towards the end of the uh, First World War, although they were never used in operations. So we'll jump ahead to the Second World War. I'm not going to spend too much time on every war. But this is an uh, a, a item called the, the Denimite. Now, if you're a uh, cannoneer, if you're firing a naval gun, you need to practice what you do. So the best way to do that is you put a man in an airplane and he tows a target behind the airplane. They call it a sleeve. And then the cannoneers, the gunners, are told to shoot behind the airplane and hit the sleeve. Doesn't always work out that way. So Reginald Denny, who was a movie star that your great-grandmother may remember, uh, also was interested in radio-controlled aircraft. And so he said, I bet we could do that mission without putting a man at risk. And so he invented the Denimite as a target drone. And during the Second World War, they made as many as 7,000 of these and used them very successfully. Well, he had a factory in Van Nuys, California. And they sent a photographer over to check out what was going on. And the photographer saw this attractive young woman who was building drones. And he said, you know, I bet she could do more than build drones. That's Marilyn Monroe. So there's the ultimate bar bet. You know, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start uh, building drones in the Second World War? So I have heard a vicious rumor that Lady Gaga is getting in the drone business. And if, it's that, if she's getting in, I'm getting out of the drone business. So. Anyway, so we're going to start and talk about uh, basically robots that fly, robots that swim, and robots that crawl. So we'll talk about the air domain, the maritime domain, and the land domain. And we'll talk about these from large to small. We'll talk about fixed wing. We'll talk about rotary wing, which is what we generally call helicopters. And we'll talk about some of the swarming uh, systems that were, uh, are being developed. So. So this is the Global Hawk. This is the largest uh, uh, unmanned aircraft we're currently flying. It's about the size of a Boeing 737. Can fly for 30 hours at a time. It, in effect, could take off from California, fly to Maine, spend 12 hours surveilling what's going on in Maine, and then fly back to California. That is a tremendous capability, and the uh, Global Hawk does that very well for us. Navy said, you know, we've got an awful lot of ocean that we need to surveil. Could we not have a version of Global Hawk? And so we developed what's called Triton, which is the Navy version. 
and you see the aircraft carrier down there, that is not to imply it could take off or land from that aircraft carrier, far too large to do that. But it's a land-based aircraft, so it flies like our P-3s, and now our P-8 aircraft, maritime patrol aircraft, fly extended distances over oceans, determine what the targets are if necessary, will then call, out on, call in additional assets to engage those targets. So here I am out at uh, Point Magoo, California with the, uh, with the Triton, and it may not be obvious from this uh, vantage point, but I stand about six foot six. So that gives you an idea. They're laughing at me, Admiral, that's not a good sign. Uh, about six foot six, and, and, and I know that's true because at graduation, <laughs> this is me with one of our professors, uh, Tyrion Lannister, who teaches a really good course in dwarfs and dragons, but as you can see, I'm clearly six and a half feet tall, so we'll use that as a model as we move forward. So here's the Reaper. That's the one that you've uh, heard most about. It's a uh, aircraft operated uh, by the Air Force. The airplane is in country somewhere, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, other locations. The pilot that is flying it is in some place like Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, and multiple other locations. So the pilot is not with the aircraft. The pilot is back home, and this thing can fly for about 24 hours. So you can have a pilot that flies for eight hours, gets out of the seat, a second pilot sits down, flies it for eight hours. Third pilot flies it for eight hours. Then it lands back in the area of the, uh, the action. We have a team they call the launch and recovery element that is actually in the area where the airplanes are operating. They do the maintenance and they send these planes off again. So it's been a tremendously successful program. Uh, in all likelihood, and uh, I, I have no access to great uh, uh, classified data, but uh, aircraft of this sort were probably used in the recent attack on the, the Iranian general and for many, many other targets. So it allows us to do the things we need to do. It carries bombs, gravity bombs, and also carries missiles and can engage those targets when they do without putting anyone at risk. This is uh, Creech Air Force Base. And they have a hole in the floor they make the Navy guys stand in so the Air Force guys look taller. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, so again, that's the, uh, the Reaper, which is a larger version of the Predator that uh, flew prior to this. The uh, U.S. Air Force has enough of these airplanes to have 60 of them in the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Absolutely remarkable capability. And uh, they are uh, designing the next generation aircraft, which will have even greater capability. So the Navy, I said, has the Triton, which does not launch from an aircraft carrier. So what if you wanted to launch an unmanned aircraft from an aircraft carrier? Well, this is the UCAS-D. The military loves acronyms, so this is the Unmanned Combat Air Systems Demonstrator. And this aircraft took off and landed from an aircraft carrier multiple times. Nobody on board. It lands perfectly every time. Third wire every time. Doesn't matter whether it's dark, whether it's light, whether the weather is bad, it can do that job. So this is the demonstrator, never intended to be an operational aircraft. We built two of them, flew them successfully. And now the next generation of this aircraft is uh, in the design phase. Uh, again, that's the, uh, the relative size of this uh, aircraft, no matter how tall I am. And it also would be able to do air-to-air -air refueling. Probably one of the most demanding tasks of any aviator is to be able to bring your aircraft up behind that tanker and, uh, and receive fuel. And the, uh, the tanker had people in it, the, uh, the uh, drone does not. And they were very successful at doing that. So the Navy, based on that experience, awarded a contract to Boeing to build what they call the MQ-25 Alpha Stingray, which I like because I drive a Corvette, so Stingray has a nice ring to me. This is going to be a refueler. It is going to go out, and so in this case, as a reverse, there will be manned pilots in the aircraft and unmanned system refueling that air, those aircraft. So, the aircraft takes off, F-35, whatever the case may be, flies out, the uh, tanker meets up with it, tops it off, it goes and does its mission, it comes back, the tanker meets up with it again, gives it enough fuel to, uh, to land successfully on the aircraft carrier. So uh, we expect to see Boeing fly the first version of this sometime later this year, 
and uh, then the designs will go on and continue and we'll see them in the uh, in the fleet here in the 2021-2022 time frame. This is the uh, RQ-170 Sentinel. Uh, this is a stealthy, low observable, unmanned aircraft, smaller than the UCAS and much smaller than the, uh, the others that we've talked about. If you all remember the uh, photo of uh, the uh, White House, uh, President Obama and the team around the table while the bin Laden attack was taking place, they were watching footage coming in from a RQ-170. This is also the one that uh, the Iranians captured. Uh, they claim they hacked it and brought it down. We think it was a mechanical communications problem. It did, in fact, land in the desert and the, uh, the Iranians or the Iraqis the Iranians did, in fact, uh, pick it up. So uh, this is a follow-on version. This is the RQ-170. We believe the RQ-180 is operating today, but again, we don't deal in the classified level. So this will look a little smaller. This is uh, the blackjack. So the notion is you can get a predator, a reaper, a global hawk to fly over wherever you're operating, but you have to ask there has to be enough aircraft availability to cover where you're going to be. So a lot of the uh, uh, Marines, soldiers, et cetera, Navy like to have an organic capability with them that they control, they can launch, and they can do the surveillance that they want to do. And this is what Blackjack is. Uh, the Marines operate this. Uh, this, again, is an indication of the, uh, the relative size of the, uh, of the Blackjack. And if you see it, I'm wearing the same blue shirt that I was in the previous picture. That got me in trouble. Uh, I went to a conference in Las Vegas, which was enough trouble. And then I came back with these pictures, and the boss said, well, clearly you went one day, took all the pictures, and went and played golf. So, so the moral of that story is change your shirt <laughs> between photos. This is uh, the AeroVironment switchblade. Again, a much smaller uh, device. And the interesting thing about this one is it has a warhead in it. So it will fly for about 25 minutes. The uh, operator is looking into the control unit there and will fly it into a small, into a target, whether it's a truck, a vehicle, whatnot. Not a big warhead, but adequate to do what you need to do. Uh, I skipped over, but this is the, uh, this is the Raven. Oh, I'll stay here. This is the Raven aircraft, and that's an actual full-size aircraft. And this will fly for about six hours at a time, and it sends back uh, uh, coverage of what it sees, both at night with infrared and during the daytime. So it's strictly surveillance, not a weapons carrier, but again, the, uh, the people on the ground always want to know what's on the other side of the hill. I'd like to know that before I have to go over there and fight. So it's, uh, uh, reconnaissance is very, very important to the people who are doing this fighting. So the uh, switchblade is very popular with the SEALs and the Special Forces, and uh, there's another version of it called Blackwing. This shoots out of a submarine, and this is strictly a surveillance device, no weapon in this one. But in effect, gives that submariner a 600-foot-tall uh, periscope to see what's going on around his ship, his submarine. And so the uh, submarine forces uh, adopted this, are uh, very, uh, very pleased with it. They do not attempt to recover it. It uh, is ex less expensive to the point where you do not have to recover it uh, once it's done its mission for you. This is a uh, concept for what they call the loyal air wingman. And the notion here is if you have a manned pilot uh, a, in a uh, fighter, an F-35 or other fighter, you could also potentially have three or four unmanned wingmen traveling with that individual. And that individual will be able to vector these uh, unmanned aircraft in to attack a target, do surveillance, whatever the case may be. And in most cases, they would return back to base and be re rehabbed for reuse. And uh, there's a number of companies developing what they call the attritable aircraft. It's cheap enough so that if you had to use it, and it would be attritable but not non-reusable. This is Gremlins, and it's a fascinating concept. The notion here is if you had a C-130 or a C-5 aircraft, as you can see uh, up in the uh, upper area there, launch these from the aircraft in flight. It would go off and do its mission, and then you would recover it in flight. 
the airplane would tow a device behind it, kind of like the refueling uh, basket that we saw earlier, and the drone would hook up, they'd winch it into the airplane, they'd take it back to the base, charge it up, and use it again. Really a remarkable capability. Uh, Gremlins, uh, the, the device flew for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and they're moving quickly on that, uh, that approach. And this is just an indicator of swarms. This is one of the biggest concerns that all of us have, that uh, you, know, you have probably seen uh, light shows over the Olympics, light shows over the Super Bowl, where you have 500 to 1,000 drones simultaneously in the air making colorful designs and whatnot. Well, what if those were drones with an evil intent? And if a uh, uh, aircraft carrier or other ship is under attack, you could probably defend against five targets or 10 targets or 20 targets. Could you defend against 500 targets inbound uh, against your ship? So how you can deal with storms is a very, uh, very big issue and something that we've got a lot, of, a lot of smart people to spend a lot of time thinking about. So now let's uh, talk about uh, rotary wings, something Admiral Chatfield knows uh, more than anybody in the room about, I suspect. This is a, a design for a rotary wing uh, with a very brave pilot who has what I would call industrial strength shin guards on because I, I just don't like the idea of ever having to land on that big ball with all those helicopters whirling around and whatnot. But uh, this is the uh, MQHC Fire Scout. So this is a Bell 407 helicopter that's been converted into unmanned operations. So it flies strictly with no one aboard, uh, launches from ships, launches from shore, can it do all the missions that a manned aircraft can do? No, but can it do a lot of them? Yes, and we've had instances where uh, earlier versions of the, uh, this aircraft, the Fire Scout, have been shot down over Libya, and no pilot is lost, no pilot is held prisoner, so there are applications and applications where you would want to use a capability like this. This, again, is a little bit smaller. This is the older version of, uh, of Fire Scout and uh, the famous blue shirt. Uh, this is the Lockheed K-Max. What this is, is the Marines said, you know, and the Army also said, we lose a large number of the people that are killed to improvised explosive devices, IEDs, that are planted along the roadside. So <clears throat> when we send a convoy of trucks out, we send three trucks full of stuff. We send a couple trucks worth of uh, people supporting that stuff. If an IED is encountered, you know, people are going to get hurt. So the notion is, what if you didn't have to put those trucks on the road at all? What if you could fly that material directly to, to the forward operating base? And that's what KMAX will do for us. And it was a, a test program that uh, went over uh, to Afghanistan. The Marines were going to operate it for a six-month test program. They kept it for two and a half years. Flew over two million cubic feet, two million pounds of cargo and didn't need to be anybody on the ground other than someone with a laser pointer saying drop the material here. Everything else was controlled from another location. So both Army and Marines are now looking at you know, what in the future force uh, would be most appropriate for the use of, uh, of something like the K-Max, which was proven to be very successful. As we shrink down in size, this is, uh, the Instant Eye Quad Rotor. And this is a program the Marines informally call Quads for Squads. And every Marine group is going to have their own drones that they will take out of their backpack and throw into the air and give them that kind of observation, that surveillance capability that they need. So uh, these are being widely, uh, widely uh, dispersed at this point and in fact, the Marines have been uh, very quick to adapt an awful lot of these unmanned systems. And are there any Marines in the audience? Ooh, okay, tell us, uh, when you get a chance, tell us more about what they're doing in that area. So, We're talking about shrinking down in size. This is probably the smallest you're going to see. This is called the Black Hornet, and that is a surveillance drone. The troops wear two of them in a box on their chest. They open the box, they take it out, they throw it in the air, and it flies for about 20 minutes and sends back video of what it sees. Then it comes back and you recharge it and you use it again. 
So you want to know what's inside the, behind the walls of that compound, you can fly your Black Hornet in there and various other locations. So it's the smallest really functional uh, military robot that's uh, currently in use. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, civilian while we're in the rotary wing business. This is a uh, unmanned air vehicle taxi. This is from a Chinese company uh, called Ehang. And the notion here is you go up to this thing and you get in and it's got an iPad and you say, take me to Fall River. It takes off and flies you to Fall River. No pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of research going into these systems. And Uber and Lyft and others say the real future is not in Uber cars, but in Uber air, that you can call these things into the top of a building and it'll take you wherever you want to go. This is another version. This is called the Volocopter. Uh, and that's, that's me in the cockpit at the uh, Singapore Air Show. And again, the idea here is this is a total electric vehicle and it will fly wherever you want it to go, pick up the passenger and go to the desired location. It's gonna be tested in uh, Abu Dhabi and some other uh, Arab countries in the, in the near future and uh, holds a great promise. Shrink down even smaller. Here's your quad rotors, your classic toys. This case is one that uh, crashed on the White House lawn. Uh, some uh, individual uh, had a little too much uh, cheer on New Year's and said, I wonder if I could fly that drone I got for Christmas over to the White House. And they did, and it crashed. Got a lot of people excited because they are very difficult to detect and very difficult to engage. And so there's a lot of systems that have been developed to uh, do that mission. This is one called Drone Killer. And the notion here is that it's an electronic device that will jam the signal and force the drone down or force it to turn around. The problem with the uh, electronic versions is it also tends to jam your television stations, your communications channels, everything else. So there are other ways potentially to deal with these drones. Okay, now if you'll stand by for the best picture of the show. You ready, Valerie? She's seen this before. There it is. <laughs> it's like call my John Wayne picture. This is the Skywall, and we took it out on the lawn at the Naval War College. We flew some quadrotor drones. Uh, this device shoots out a projectile using compressed air. Uh, it goes near the uh, target. It splits open and puts out a net, and it captures the drone and brings the drone down with a parachute. Doesn't hit anybody in the head. Gets, gives you the opportunity to go find the drone, maybe determine where it came from. And so it's a very interesting kinetic approach to uh, stopping these things. We had some issues with our security folks, and we said we're going to go shoot down some drones. But uh, they, they ultimately let us do it. And uh, that, was, that was our Christmas card, what, two years ago? Yeah. Uh, Valerie says, you cannot send that to everybody. I said, all right, I'll send my own. So. This is interesting. They are actually training hawks to intercept drones. And they've done that successfully. The ASPCA said, hey, I, I don't like the sound, you know, the, the, the whirring propellers are going to hurt the uh, claws of the birds. So they developed little bitty Kevlar gloves uh, for the birds to wear and whatnot. So they've tried it. It works. But there's a lot of, uh, lot of issues with using a, a, a living system like that. But, OK, let's switch away from the stuff that flies. And let's talk about maritime systems, since this is the Naval War College. So this is just a few examples of some of the various designs. The big yellow one in the top, that's also down in the Future Forces Gallery near the library if you want to take a uh, closer look at that at some point. But one of the more successful programs right now is uh, this one, which was called Sea Hunter. This is a 131-foot long ship, surface ship, recently went from San Diego to Hawaii and back with no one aboard. It understands rules of the road, et cetera, and it is the forerunner. They're building a second one of the Sea Hunters now, and they're doing design work. There's as much as $400 million in the budget this coming year to design what would be larger unmanned surface ships. And what are they going to do? Well, it's yet to be determined. We talked to the, uh, 
the Commodore of the Surface Development Group in Coronado yesterday, and they're uh, looking at a lot of options. Uh, perhaps it's uh, an unmanned arsenal ship, which means you put hundreds if not thousands of missiles on this ship and there's no one aboard. And the command and control is done by the surface ship or the air asset that you have available. So it tremendously expands the, uh, the ability of you to carry weapons. Uh, it also could do surveillance work. You could send them out just to do surveillance ahead of the battle group. So in the next uh, 18 to 24 months, we're gonna see more development on how exactly we're going to use these unmanned surface vehicles. Uh, the Chief of Naval Operations recently said, you know, this is one of the keys to the future. We need to stop running away from these things and start embracing these things. But again, they can't do everything that a manned platform can do, but we need to find out what they can do. In the uh, unmanned undersea vehicle realm, this is a, an eye chart for you that uh, just indicates everything from extra large to large to medium to small unmanned undersea vehicles that are being used. And this is a picture of uh, a whole group of these. These are wave gliders. They can stay at sea for six months at a time. They actually harvest electricity from solar panels and from the movement of the waves as the vehicle goes through the water. And so it can go for months at a time, thousands of miles, very slow, but gives you all kinds of readings about the water temperature, depth, salinity, all the kind of things you particularly care about if you're looking for, uh, for enemy submarines. So small enough in some cases, they're launched from ships and even some of them are launched uh, by hand. One of the more uh, fascinating programs that uh, we followed very closely is this one. It's called the Echo Voyager or the ORCA program. And this is me and a group of folks at the rollout of the, uh, the unmanned submarine. And this is, again, to give you an idea of the size of this thing. It's, eight, it's 80 feet long. It dives to 11,000 feet depth of water. Not 1,100, but 11,000 feet depth of water. It's diesel electric, so it runs on battery for about 48 hours, comes near the surface, puts up a snorkel, runs its diesel generator, recharges its battery, and gets additional update on its orders if necessary, and then goes back out to do what it's going to do. So what's it going to do? It could theoretically launch missiles, it could launch UAVs, it could drop mines, it could even swim seals from the device, not from 11,000 feet depth of water. If uh, Admiral Howe was here, I'd make sure he understood I'm not proposing that they, they go that, that deep with it. But uh, Boeing spent $100 million of their own money to, bu to build this system and said, if we build it, they will come. And in fact, the Navy has come and has ordered five of these, and we're going to uh, see what they are designed best to do. And uh, again, let our multi-billion dollar manned submarines do what they're best at and let this, if your main interest is to set off a harbor somewhere and keep track of who's coming and going from that harbor, this is a really good way to do it and uh, does not bore your crew to death either. So uh, ORCA, you'll be seeing a lot more about in the near future. So that's some of the maritime systems, a lot of other ones, but uh, we'll move on to uh, ground-based systems. This is a, uh, a high-speed tank developed by a company called Howe and Howe and it is uh, able to go up incredible uh, angles and do extreme high speed through mud and everything else. Uh, very impressive. This is the pack bot. That's a picture of it, and this is it right here. So this is an actual uh, explosive ordnance disposal robot. And in theory, this all folds up and you can pack it on your back and carry it into where you need to go. Uh, the smaller one here is called Dragon Runner over there. Dragon Runner is one that, again, is designed for the troops to carry it on their back. And this particular, the Dragon Runner does not have a manipulator arm, but another soldier or Marine could be carrying that manipulator arm. They put the two of them together and they go off and do whatever mission they're assigned to do. But we, uh, the uh, military has saved thousands of lives because in the old days, if you saw something, a pile of trash you thought might be an explosive device, you put on the big bomb suit, you went down there, you tried to investigate it. Uh, hopefully, it did not detonate. In this case, you send the robot down. It will give you an indication of what it is. 
it'll lay an explosive charge back off and then you can detonate the explosive charge from a safe distance. So very, very popular systems. Uh, again, the troops, troops love them. This is uh, Kinetic Mars, the Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System. And uh, that's Admiral Christensen, one of the past presidents here at the college, good friend of the, uh, the Chatfields. Uh, when we told security we were bringing a robot with a machine gun on board, I had another, uh, another few hoops to go through, but this device has a machine gun, it has a uh, tear gas dispenser, laser dazzler, has a communications uh, speaker and microphone so it can roll into an area and say clear this area or we're going to engage the target. Uh, it has been used operationally. Uh, they're being used at the uh, Korean DMZ uh, at this point and whatnot. And so kinetic, that's how they spell kinetic in, uh, in Massachusetts apparently, uh, is, uh, is a company that is uh, developing this and a number of other systems. So again, they're very interested in uh, what can we use robots to do to aid the men and women in uniform. This is one called MUT the uh, multi-utility tactical transport. Now to me, that guy's putting the gun on it because he doesn't trust it, but I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, what people don't realize is that a soldier going into combat has more weight on his or her back than a knight in shining armor used to have when they were wearing their suit of armor. It's an incredible load. And so they will theoretically fly great distances get thrown out of the airplane, the helicopter, whichever the case may be, and hump all this stuff wherever they're gonna go and need to fight. Very, very difficult. So what if you had a robot that could carry a lot of that material, carry your supplies, carry your additional batteries and whatnot, maybe carry a weapon like this one shows. Uh, wouldn't that be a great, uh, a great aid to what we're trying to do? So a number of uh, vehicles, everything from wheel to track, and that little bitty small one there is designed <clears throat> You throw it through a window and then the people outside can see what's going on inside the building. And what they find is as soon as you throw it through the window, everybody in the building runs out because they think it's going to blow up. And of course the SEAL said, can you make it blow up? And I said, well, you know, it's designed so you can throw it off a third floor roof and it'll keep going. I'm not sure we can throw it off a third floor roof with an explosive on it. So you can have it either way, but you can't have it both ways. So. Again, a lot of uh, research being done on what we're going to do in the, the ground environment. Company uh, Boston Dynamics, you may have seen some of their robots. Uh, if you Google Boston Dynamics and look at what some of their robots have done, they've got one in particular, it's called Atlas. And there's the greatest video of uh, this robot who comes out, picks up that box. The guy with the hockey stick knocks it out of his hand. The robot goes, okay. Bends over, picks it up again. Guy knocks it out of his hands again. And you can see the robot looking at him like, when we take over, <laughs> you're the first to go. <laughs> so, so take a look at those, uh, those videos. They're, they're very humorous. But you know, part of the problem is you know, we've seen so many movies, TV shows our whole life. We think making robots walk around and do stuff is easy. Well, it is not. It's very difficult to get this thing to walk on two feet and do what needs to be done. So uh, Boston Dynamics and a number of other companies are doing some great work in this area. Uh, the Navy's looking at a uh, robotic firefighter. It says, why do we have to have a sailor go into that compartment with smoke and fire and whatnot if we could send a robot in to do that mission and carry that heavy hose in there and put out the fire? So a lot going on in that area. This is a shot from uh, my class one. Uh, one uh, trimester, uh, Mike Sherlock and I teach this course, uh, and we invite the companies to come in and display their systems. So the students actually get a chance to play with these things. So we go into that little patio that's near the, uh, the library and do our version of BattleBots and uh, roll these things around. The one I'm leaning my foot on is a round robot called GuardBot, and it actually rolls where it wants to go. The cameras are on either side of it, stabilized, and you can see what it wants to do. The smaller one down front, I've got a model of that in my office, can roll under a car and check for explosives and whatnot under the car. So very, very uh, useful. And uh, the companies will come, will start again. 
uh, teaching in March, and we'll put out a note to all of the uh, students if they want to come by and uh, see these. We do ground day, airtime, maritime day, ground day, air day, maritime day, legal and ethics day, where we talk about the legality and ethical issues related to these robots, and that's always a very good session. So uh, that'll be coming up again here soon. So let's talk a little bit about civilian use. We've talked mostly military so far. Driverless cars. Now the picture of the uh, couple in the back seat of that yellow convertible, that's not what we have in mind. Driverless cars, perhaps they're gonna look more like the little white one, or they're gonna look like the Tesla that you see there. And Tesla, you know, has a, a, a driverless mode, but they say don't trust it. You have to stay behind the wheel. You have to keep your hands on the steering wheel in case something goes wrong, you can grab onto it and regain control. There have been some accidents. There have been some people killed in, uh, in Teslas. Uh, in one case, the, uh, a truck pulled in front of the Tesla. The truck was white, the sky was white, the sensor couldn't tell the difference and drove right into the truck. Uh, they found that the driver was watching a Harry Potter video at the time. It was still playing when they, uh, when they got to the scene of the accident. So, you know, they, driverless cars are coming. They will be at some point to the point where, in theory, you could get in it and say, take me to Chicago and climb in the back seat. They're not there today. But there's a lot of work being done by Tesla and other manufacturers to make these driverless cars a possibility. This is an interesting uh, system. This is called Zipline. And what this is, is a medical delivery system. And it's being operated in uh, Rwanda and Uganda. And the infrastructure in those countries is, is not the best. Rainy season, the roads become almost impassable. So the notion here is what if you needed blood samples, you needed medicine, whatever. Uh, there's a central hub that flies the zip line drone and it gets over the target, it throws it out by parachute and it's recovered by the people at the location. They have made tens of thousands of deliveries very, very successfully and they claim that uh, within 15 minutes from the time of getting the order, they'll have their drone in the air and it can get to wherever it's going. It's fast enough to get about an hour, hour and a half uh, to where it's going and then make its return trip. So. Uh, very successful, and a lot of other uh, companies are also looking in this area. This is uh, another medical application. Uh, there are uh, flying defibrillator re machines that you can call down and hook someone up who's having a cardiac uh, situation and hopefully bring them back to life. There are versions of this which carry a float to swimmers who are drowning in the surf. It's hard to get out there to that person with a jet ski or a rowboat or whatever you're trying to do. You can take the drone out there and the drone yells, hey, here it comes, throws the float down and the individual is able to, to, uh, to be saved. So this is uh, precision agriculture. Uh, there are be these are being used today. They're being used a lot in Japan. The uh, FAA still has some issues with uh, using these extensively in the United States. But the idea here is you fly over your crops and you look at them and you determine where this is infested with disease, this has got not enough water, needs to be water, other issues and whatnot. So in one day you can get a complete readout on everything that's going on in your uh, field and address that and increase the productivity and you know, everyone knows that the, there's gonna be a tremendous need to increase the productivity of our farms in the uh, coming future and drones is a potential way to do some of that. This is uh, the notion of could we deliver packages directly to your door? This is uh, Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, uh, is doing this experimental work and they have delivered burritos, they've delivered pizzas, they've delivered medicine and whatnot. And what happens here is there's propellers on the top of those uh, structures going back that gives you the vertical lift and the ability to hover. And then when it wants to fly forward, it uses its forward propellers to do that. And it drops that thing down and you come pick it up and you've got whatever you're looking for. They've even come up with the notion of could we have a flying warehouse? And in this case, it's okay. I'm at the Super Bowl and I want a 49ers t-shirt maybe a bad choice, but uh, you want a uh, Chiefs t-shirt, 
you know, in theory, you could go out in a parking lot, order one, and this thing would bring it directly to you. So I'm not sure we want that. I'm not sure I want uh, hundreds or thousands of drones buzzing around my neighborhood. There's all kinds of issues about how do you do airspace deconfliction control. I suspect the Admiral may have flown near some drones she wished weren't there on occasion. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion with the FAA and whatnot, and maybe we have a drone zone from 200 to 400 feet, and we know that's primarily where the drones are going to operate. But we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, frankly, do we need our burrito in 30 minutes, or could we wait a little bit longer? I don't know, but the capability is there, and it's being experimented with. And even closer to home, Wally. Okay, have you all met Wally at uh, Stop and Shop? Uh, a number of uh, grocery stores have Wally. Wally runs around. Primarily, he's looking for spills. He's looking for uh, shelves that need to be restocked. Uh, I think maybe he's looking for shoplifters. I don't know, <laughs> but, but they don't say for sure. But uh, Wally is an interesting character. So whenever we go shopping, I follow Wally around for an extended period. So. <laughs> I'm easy to amuse. So. so. We've seen robots that fly, swim, and crawl. Uh, to learn more, uh, I do have a book. I'm not selling my book, but if you're interested, there's some information about my book. Uh, this happens to be the Marina Bay Sands uh, Hotel in Singapore, and uh, those are my pasty white feet that uh, <laughs> I knew when you came here today, you did not anticipate seeing that and wish you hadn't. So. So that's basically what I've got to say. We've got uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. And uh, David, are you going to be able to do a uh, uh, microphone? Yeah, sure. Ah, good. Oh. Just the only thing I would say, John, is uh, plans for next uh, robots. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, let me, uh, uh, I, I was going to tell you at the closing, but I'll tell you now. Since David said, tell me now, I'm going to tell you now. Uh, we had a group of a dozen uh, of, of you uh, folks go on a tour of Newport today, and I think it went very well. We hope to do those uh, before each lecture. Uh, there are sign-up sheets. We can take about 13 people in the, say again? No more than 13, because you've got to have a driver and somebody who's going to give you the, uh, the history of Newport. So if you're interested, uh, there's sign-up sheets both for next week, the we or two weeks from now, and the, uh, the events following that. So this is something that uh, Mr. Scoville has, uh, has arranged, and I think we're trying to make these events kind of multi-purpose. So not only do you get a lecture, you get to talk to the experts who can uh, support you in what you need to do, and you can also maybe get a tour of Newport. So. All right, uh, questions? Yes, sir. Don't give away any secrets. If there's a finite number of frequencies available, couldn't a party have a very powerful transmitter and do a sweep? They don't care about putting out televisions or phones. They want to stop a drone. Couldn't they do a Yeah, the question is, uh, you know, could there not be a major jammer that jams the signals and knocks all these things out? And the answer is yes. Uh, it, it is a problem. You can uh, encrypt your data lines in a lot of cases, but that's, that's expensive and difficult to do. We've not done it to date because in the uh, Persian Gulf and other locations, we've pretty much owned the territory and we haven't had to worry about that. We all recognize it going forward. If you're flying this drone from Creech Air Force Base, the signal goes from Creech through undersea cables to the area of uh, interest, to the satellite, and then back down to the, uh, to the aircraft. So if you cut that signal at any point during that process, you're going to have problems with, uh, with operating your system. So that drives you to a more autonomous system that can do what it needs to do without having mid-course guidance, if you will. So very good question. The whole management of the, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is, is something the, uh, the smart people are looking at and trying to come up with a plan. Thank you. Other questions? Sir. Yeah, this is a question. There was a TED talk that uh, talked about drones. In reality, there's a fake TED talk that talks about killbots. 
And it basically says, well, what if I had that one like that little one I showed you? And what if it had uh, facial recognition to the point where it goes, Jimmy, we're coming to get you. And Jimmy's face, you know, that would work for us. So, <laughs> so, you know, in this fictional TED talk, they said, okay, what if we went around and we could selectively kill the people that we wanted to kill? Uh, it doesn't exist today. There's a lot of r rules and regulations that would preclude it from happening. We, the good guys, are not going to do that. Does that mean that our enemies would not? Not so sure about that. So, they, you know, there's nothing technologically hard to understand about the ability to do that. And uh, so it's something, again, w we need to watch. And as the whole robotics world evolves, these issues keep coming up, and the, the, the smart engineers are going to have to figure out how to deal with it. So, thank you. Other questions? Way in the back, sir. So, considering the, the time of creation and development of some of these robotic systems compared to the time of creation and build of our military systems, so, for example, you know, the new aircraft carrier that just came offline or the thermal combat ships, these are, these are nearly a decade or more in the making from start to finish, whereas these things can go from conception Absolutely. You know, the whole issue of the acquisition process and how long it takes to go from concept to design to construction to implementation, operational use and whatnot is, is far too long. And there's a lot of reasons why it is the way it is, but there is a great push, particularly in the Air Force, going on. Will Roper, who used to be the head of the Strategic Capabilities Office, that spent a lot of money to make find ways to do this quicker, faster, better. Uh, is now in the Air Force, and they are looking at, you know, how can we go in a six to 12 month period from concept to actual design and implementation. 3D printing, which you mentioned, is a great way to do it. The Marines, the Marines have 3D printers with a lot of their units now, and the young, uh, young Marines are the ones that are particularly good with it. And, you know, I don't need to carry this part in a parts bin if I could manufacture it on demand, and they are able to do that. So. There are 3D printers on ships now and a lot of things that are being done, but we fully recognize that we have to get on board. The Defense uh, Innovation Unit, uh, the DIU, uh, spends a lot of money in Silicon Valley and other places, a lot of time and a lot of money to reach out to these people. And a lot of times it's smaller companies. It's the small companies that are, are quick to react and, and come up with the designs. A lot of times the big companies buy the small companies. <laughs> so the issue is can you allow them to continue to do that quick design and effort that they need to do and still be maybe within a larger environment and whatnot. But yeah, and you know, the enemy, you know, the enemy, the uh, uh, Al Qaeda and others have, have used these systems. They'll get a commercial drone that you can buy for $500 and they'll put a grenade under it and take it over and fly it and drop it on a, uh, on a group of troops. And the uh, U.S. Army and others, that's one of their primary concerns is how do you protect it? Because there was a time when you had to be a nation to have an Air Force. Nowadays, you do not. And if you talk about something as, you know, like chemical or biological weapons, you know, uh, it's been said that you could shut down the uh, New York Harbor in uh, one day for about $5,000. Now, that's a scary thought. And, you know, how do you prevent that from happening? So. That's the good news for the day. So anybody got any happy questions? <laughs> Anyone else? Any of our younger guys got anything they'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, tanks are, uh, are one of the issues that they are incredibly big and heavy and whatnot, and the notion is could they you know, benefit more from maneuverability than over-arming and whatnot. There are a lot of efforts underway to build human skeletons, exoskeletons, that people would wear, and if you remember the uh, 
the alien movies where uh, she would wear this device and lift up these tremendous weights. There are designs going on now where uh, an Air Force uh, armorer who could reload an aircraft, pick up a 250-pound bomb, walk over, put it onto the airplane, take it back, and whatnot. So there's a lot of things that are being done to enhance the ability of human being to do what they need to do. So good question. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Sir. So as we start developing real AI where robots are going out and conducting missions and going out and performing activities, part of that is obviously going to be self-preservation for the robot itself. How do you balance self-preservation for the robot with putting a human life first, especially if all Yeah, the whole issue of artificial intelligence is uh, Tim mentioned that conference we did in, in Rome was all about the legal and ethical issues of, of artificial intelligence. And the issue is these systems that are being developed do machine learning and they can change their programming themselves while they're moving ahead. So you're never exactly sure what this robot theoretically is going to do at any given point in time. You know, how do you build safeguards into that? You know, Isaac Asimov, the famous three rules of robotics, which are fictional, but basically says a robot cannot harm a human being. And a robot cannot, it will protect itself unless it would cause harm to a human being. And so can you build that kind of ethical governor into a robot? There's a lot of work that's been done by that. Ron Arkin and others uh, down at the University of uh, uh, in Atlanta have done a lot of work on that notion. And there's some thought that says a robot could actually be more humane than a human being. A robot does not get mad. A robot does not get upset because somebody in his, his uh, squad was killed. A robot executes what it was told to do. I'm not sure we are going to build any robots that you know, have that severe a self-preservation mode built into them. I think there will always be human control and, a, and a, a kill switch that allows you to disable that thing. Otherwise, we get in the Terminator scenario that we've all seen, and we don't want our Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, crawling around doing that kind of stuff. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Are we the leaders in this type of technology? You know, we're doing very well. We were, we were certainly on the cutting edge. Uh, there's a lot of good work being done by a lot of other people. The Israelis are particularly good. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians are doing an awful lot on this. The Chinese have said they will be the leaders in artificial intelligence within 10 years. And they are putting tremendous amounts of money and emphasis on that subject. Uh, you know, the uh, DOD just recently formed the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Uh, General Shanahan was here a few weeks ago talking about what we're trying to do. But you know, artificial intelligence is a scale. It's everything from you get in an elevator and you push the button. You know, that's kind of there's a brain in there that says, "Oh, I understand. He wants me to go to the third floor." You go to the third floor. Self-driving cars is a form of artificial intelligence. Will we ever get to the point where robots become smart as human beings so they recognize that they have a personality and seek to protect themselves? A lot of people say no. They say if it is going to happen, it's 20, 50 years downrange and whatnot. So we need to be alert to what's going on. We have to track what's going on with artificial intelligence. And we need to make sure that you know, the good guys are keeping track of it. And at the conference in Rome, there was discussion of maybe we need somebody like you know, the International Air Traffic Control Organization sets the rules and regulations for air travel all around the world. And so English is the language that everybody uses. The rules and regulations for how you're going to fly those airplanes and what you're going to do for maintenance are all laid out. And if you're going to be flying in the international world, you're going to need to follow those rules. Could there be an organization that was kind of the overall control for artificial intelligence and says, here's the rules, and we expect you to follow them? bad guys choose not to follow them, then you're going to have to have some kind of a process in place to, uh, to uh, find out about it and, and take appropriate action. But it's, a, uh, it's one, of the, uh, one of the hottest topics is, is AI and what, is it, what does it mean for the future. Any other questions? 
Okay, well, it's been a great pleasure to be with you today. I will be down here, and uh, if anybody wants to come down and get pictures with the robots or ask any questions, and please uh, see MWR, Fleet and Family Support, and Military One Source if you have any questions. The uh, next one of these will be on the 25th, and it'll be uh, Dr. Craig Simons, who's one of the finest uh, historians anywhere in the world, will be given a presentation called Lincoln and His Admirals. A lot of people don't know exactly what the Navy did during the Civil War. Well, Dr. Simons is going to tell you about that. So uh, hope to see you back here on the 25th. Thank you very much.